five years. That's how long Coyote and her dad, Rodeo, have lived on the road in an old school bus crisscrossing the nation. It's also how long ago Coyote lost her mom and two sisters in a car crash. Coyote hasn't been home in all that time, but when she learns that the park in her old neighborhood is being demolished, the very same park where she, her mom, and her sisters buried a treasured memory box, she devises an elaborate plan to get her dad to drive 3,600 miles back to Washington State without him realizing it. Along the way, they'll pick up a strange crew of misfit travelers. Lester has a lady love to meet. Salvador and his mom are looking to start over. Val needs a safe place to be herself. And then there's Gladys. Over the course of thousands of miles, Coyote will learn that going home can sometimes be the hardest journey of all, but that with friends by her side, she just might be able to turn her once upon a time into a happily ever after. For first chapter Friday, here is The Remarkable Journey of Coyote Sunrise by Dan Gemenhart. There were big days and there were small days and there were bad days and there were good days and I suppose I could pick any one of them for my once upon a time but if I'm going to be truthful and truthful is something I always aim to be then really there is only one best place to start this story. It all started with Ivan. Once upon a time it was hot and I was sweaty. It was about five months before my 13th birthday, give or take. We were someplace in Oregon. Honestly, I don't even remember the name of the town, but I know it was on the dry hot side of the state, away from the ocean. The whole world was so yellow and shining from the beating down sun that you had to squint no matter where you looked. The black top of the gas station parking lot radiated the heat right back up at you, so it felt like you were getting cooked from both sides. I suppose most barefoot people would have been hooting and hopping with that sizzling asphalt, burning the bottoms of their feet. But my soles were used to it, and I walked along easy as you please. My t-shirt was stuck with sweat to my back. The braid that hung down nearly to my blue jean belt loops slapped wetly against it as I walked. The man behind the counter looked at my bare feet and started to say something. Miss, you can't, but I knew where he was going with it before he started. That tyrannical, no shoes, no shirt, no service rule is pretty darn universal in America's gas station convenience stores. I just waved at him and cut him off. I know, I know, I said, and kept walking. I'll only be a minute. I'd never been in that particular gas station before, but it was exactly the same as every other one. So really, I'd been in it a million times. Rows of plastic wrapped junk food, walls lined with glass doored coolers full of pop and beer and flavored iced teas. I walked past the metal racks of beef jerky and candy bars to the pot of gold at the end of my rainbow, the slushy machine. There it was, humming in the corner next to the coffee dispensers and soda fountain. My mouth started watering as soon as I saw that neon colored sugar slush swirling around under the big plastic dome. There was a kid standing in front of it looking up at the churning slurry with desire written plain and clear across his face. 
he was seven or eight and staring up at the left flavor, which was an unlikely pinkish color labeled wild watermelon. Big mistake, I said, walking up next to him and grabbing a cup from the pull-down dispenser. He jerked his head to look at me. What is? I nodded with my chin at the slushy he was coveting. Watermelon. That's a no-go. Never waste your time with anything that claims to be watermelon or banana flavored. It's a scam every time. He squinted at me, clearly unconvinced. Doesn't matter anyway, he said. My mom already said no. He threw his head dr back dramatically. But I'm so hot. I yanked down another cup and held it out to him. Here, he, I said, my treat. The kid's face lit up. For reals, he asked. Yep. But then his face dropped again, just as quick. But mom said, no, I'll probably get in trouble. I shrugged. You're probably going to get in trouble at some point today anyway. You may as well get a slushy out of it. He thought about that for a real short second and then snatched the cup from my hand. But I really would think twice about getting watermelon, I added. My advice fell on deaf ears and in a flash, he was pulling down the knob and squirting glistening pink slush into his cup. I filled mine with the other flavor, funky fruit punch, which was the superior choice in every respect. That kid looked me up and down as we walked toward the cashier. You're wearing weird clothes. I looked down at my raggedy blue jeans and grease stained white t-shirt. I'm basically wearing the same thing you're wearing, I pointed out. Exactly, he said, and I'm a boy. So? So boys and girls shouldn't wear the same thing. Well then, you better change, cause I ain't. He had nothing to say to that, which was probably the right move on his part, since I hadn't paid for his slushy yet. I ignored the hostile, good riddance look on the cashier's face when I paid. Like hot asphalt on bare feet, it was something I was used to. Me and the kid walked through the jangling door and back out into the heat. The highway hummed not too far off in the distance. The kid took a big slurping suck on his slushy straw. He swallowed and smacked his lips and nodded. Well, I asked, how's the wild watermelon? He ran his tongue over his lips, considering. Sweet, he said, weird. Not really like watermelon at all. I nodded and took a suck of my delicious, flavored as advertised, funky fruit punch. Lesson learned, kid, now you know. He looked glumly at the phosphorescent pinkness in his cup. I sighed, it's tough seeing a kid get a bad break. I held mine out to him. Here I said, trade. His eyebrows shot high. For reals? Sure, I don't mind it all that much. I lied, and you're the one who's getting in trouble. Better make it worth it. We swapped slushies and I took a sip of wild watermelon. He watched for my reaction. I think I said that the flavor designer at the slushy company needs to spend a little more time eating watermelon. The kid nodded. I tapped my slushy cup against his. Cheers, kid. Enjoy. He said, thanks. And I said, you're welcome. And then he said, you want a kitten? And I swallowed a mouthful of syrupy slush and licked my lips and wiped a bit of juice off my chin with my arm and said, what? You want a kitten? He repeated. He pointed to where an older boy sat on the curb next to a big cardboard box. We're giving them away. Want one? I looked out at the big beat up yellow school bus parked next to one of the gas pumps. There was no way I'd be allowed to get a cat. 
It was a no-go for sure. I sighed. Well, I said, let's go take a look at least. There were five kittens in that cardboard box, and when I leaned over to look in, they all looked up at me with big round eyes and triangle ears, and I tell you, I was smitten. Who are you? The older kid asked, and the younger one said, she bought me a slushie. And the older kid held out his hand, and the younger one handed it over. The older kid took a slurp and smacked his lips and nodded and handed it back. You want a kitten? He asked. They were as brothers as brothers can be, those two. I eyed the bus again and cocked an eyebrow. He was nowhere to be seen. Well, I guess I don't know yet. It's complicated. Both boys nodded. They had parents. They knew how it was. Go ahead, pick one up, the older boy said. Take it for a spin. I pursed my lips. They were awfully cute, those tiny things, with their wispy tails and whiskers. I thought about how I could get away with it. The kittens mewed up at me, squealing and scratchy little squeaks. That could be a problem. Which one's the quietest one? Without a moment's pause, both kids pointed out the smallest one. A gray and white striped puff of fur off by itself, a little ways in a corner of the box. Something's wrong with that one, the younger kid said. The other ones never shut up, but that one hasn't made a peep since it was born. Really, I said, and narrowed my eyes in approval. She sounds just about right then. It's a boy. It is? Check for yourself. No, thanks. I'll take your word for it. I crouched there looking at that little silent white and gray fur ball. He looked back at me. He had a very serious look about him, solemn even, like maybe he had it backward and what he thought was happening was him deciding whether or not to pick me. He was not a kitten to be trifled with. I set my slushy on the curb and reached in and cradled that little thing in my hand as gentle as I could. A hush fell over my whole self when I felt that trembling soul in my big clumsy hand. He was all fragile feeling bones and feathery fur and racing frantic heartbeats. I held him right up to my face. He looked back at me, his eyes huge and ears forward, but he didn't make a sound. He didn't meow, didn't growl, didn't squeak, didn't wiggle. We looked deep into each other's eyes, me and that kitten. My heart got a little bigger with each beat. I tell you, something changed when that kitten and I looked at each other. Something big, either something in the universe that had been sitting still for too long started moving again or something that was moving finally fell still. Either way, it was something. You see, I'd walked into that gas station alone and I'd walked out of it alone, just like I'd walked into and out of gas stations alone every day for like years. And maybe right then and there holding that kitten is when I'd just had enough of all that aloneness it was a quiet moment and maybe one that anyone watching from outside my heart wouldn't even have noticed. But I tell you, it was a big moment all the same. The kitten yawned, a jaw gaping yawn that showed off his sharp needle teeth and scaly gray tongue and a decent percentage of his throat. Yeah, I whispered, you're the one, ain't ya? And this has been a preview of The Remarkable Journey of Coyote Sunrise. <laughs>